Hey everyone, Andre here, and I have to get something off my chest. There has been something that's been bugging me for years, and by years, I mean decades, pretty much since I was born. And here's why. So here's the original box of Super Mario Bros. 3. Now the cover is cool, I've got no problems with it. But if we flip the box over, we can see various screenshots from the game, and that's when we run into a little issue. Because that middle screenshot, the one of the Parabeetles, is of a level that doesn't exist in the actual game. Now, sure, there is a Parabeetle level in the game, as in one, but that one takes place in the sky, and this one most definitely doesn't. So, I wanted to fix this. In fact, I wanted to fix this back in the original Super Mario Maker. The only problem is that game didn't have slopes, so I had to wait until Super Mario Maker 2. But I finally accomplished my lifelong dream of making this level a reality. And I may have gone a little overboard with it. So please, if you can, check out the level for yourself before watching our video on it, because I really designed it with the player in mind. Uh, the code's on the screen right now, please play it through yourself before watching the rest of the video, because I assure you, I think it's more fun that way than watching me play through it myself. And hey, don't take my word for it, because here's a super quick snippet of John playing through it himself. Oh, that's super cool! See? And John wouldn't lie. So again, please use the code on the screen to check out the level for yourself, if you can, because I really do think it's worth it. But hey, if not, fine, let's just get to the video itself. So here's my playthrough of Super Mario Bros. 3, The Lost Level. And in this case, I'll let the level speak for itself, and then I'll come back in at the end to explain my idea behind the level and how exactly it works in some parts. Ready? Here we go. That's weird. There's a TV here playing Mario with an NES controller uh, connected to an NES itself. What happens if we turn it off? 
<laughs> well, when you look at that, we turned it off and killed the game itself. And we've got that wonderful Gusty Garden music playing too from Mario Galaxy. And now that the NES is destroyed, Mario is finally free. As he's reborn into whatever life awaits him now. See, I told you I went just a little bit overboard with the theme. So, alright, let's go ahead and break down how exactly I made this level and why I made some of the choices that I did. So first up is, let's just talk about the screenshot itself. Because I just stared at this thing forever, trying to figure out, for one, um, you know, how to recreate that in Super Mario Maker 2, and also what it would mean to make a level based around the elements I saw there. So first up is, looking at the screenshot itself, we have some key elements. We have the pair beetles, we got coins, we got blocks, we got... Uh, the, um, the music blocks as well. We have the slopes, of course. Um, now there is one big difference, though, and that is a fact, is that that's grassy terrain, whereas that doesn't exist in Super Mario Maker 2 and the Super Mario Bros. 3 theme, which sucks! Uh, so I went with Desert instead, which I thought would be pretty much the closest, um, in terms of, you know, in terms of look. Now my original idea was that this would be more of a future version, like a Mushroomy Kingdom version of this, of this level that doesn't exist. But then when I went with the whole, like, glitchy angle, or like, beta angle, you know, like, the, the, the fact that the, that Mario 3 is glitching and that's how you access this level, I'm like, oh, this actually makes perfect sense now, but it, it accesses the wrong tile set maybe, and that's all the justification I needed. <laughs> Alright, um... Now looking more at the screenshot, uh, we have the parabeetle placement, which as you can see right now, doesn't match up with how I've arranged it here. And that's because the way I've arranged it, it mimics the way that they'll actually appear, um, or will actually result in them appearing in the exact way that they do in the game. So if I scroll back far enough, we can see that uh, as, they, as they spawn onto the screen, they actually do spawn or will appear in the right place, or as close as I could possibly get it. Um, now you might be wondering is, so a couple things here. One, uh, why am I using auto scroll? And that's for two key reasons. Actually it's for one, but the other ones uh, accidentally worked out perfectly. So for one is, again, these parabeels are going to spawn at different points uh, depending on when they appear on the screen. And having auto scroll is the best way to ensure that they appear in the spots when I need them to, uh, you know, to mimic the, where they appear in the box art. Um, now that is a secondary concern, because the main reason I went with the auto scrolling is because if you look at this picture, um, Mario is not where he should be if the screen is scrolling with them. It should be more centered, as I recall. Um, and whereas now the camera, he's not lined up. He's not lined up uh, as if it were. You know, he's not lined up quite where it would be um, if it were actually following him. Which indicated to me it's probably an auto scrolling level because he, this couldn't exist otherwise, um, or Mario couldn't exist in that position. And not only that uh, is the fact that the primary parabeetle level in the game. Um, the only the only other one in the game, or the only one in the actual game, is also an auto-scrolling level. So it made sense for me to, to go that route with it. And I thought it would make things a little bit more interesting, especially because if it weren't auto-scrolling, then you could just cut, catch a ride on a pair beetle and ride it, you know, as long as you want to. And that kind of defeats the point of Buzzy Beetles, I feel like, where it's, you know, more timing-based. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why I decided to go with the auto-scrolling thing, especially because I thought it would just make the level more interesting as well. Um, particularly, uh, particularly with something else coming up here, because there's something else I was, I was racking my brain on. There's a few things here. So again, I have, um, the, I have the leaf here, uh, in the block, like in the, uh, like in the, um, stage itself. And so that made me think, well, I have to add something to the stage that makes use of it. And that's where you can access a... A secret area here if you if you manage to fly before the end as you also saw in the video I can access it using a single pair beetle here if you catch it in time um, but there's just enough room here to run and uh, fly you know start flying and reach the little secret area there uh, but beyond this though um, so, as you may also saw there's a secret area above here because there's something that was bugging me here and that's why are these music blocks and pair beetles here like pair beetles because, okay here's the main thing I ran into right in the other pair, in the main parabeetle level, it's mostly in the sky. There's no terrain really to land on, except I think a, a, you know at occasional spots. Otherwise, if you drop off on the parabeetles, you're going to die. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense in a level with ground seemingly for for it. Uh, and, and that's where you know. But I, so when I was looking at the screenshot, I'm like, well, how do I make this turn this into an actual level? And I'm gonna be all over the place here, so sorry for my kind of rambling, especially because I'm under a time limit here. <laughs> um, and so I'm like, well, this this level is gonna be primarily be based around ground. And as part of that, looking at the screenshot, I'm like, well, what's the point of the music blocks and pair beetles here if you're if if it's completely safe to you know there's no danger of falling 
um, you know, there's no danger of falling from them. So I had two thoughts. One, you can use parabeetles as obstacles. And either that that exists to some extent, obviously, because it's just by their very nature. Um, but I don't think it was that fun of a mechanic to use. So instead, I leaned more into what if you could use the parabeetles uh, as, you know, um, as ways to reach different parts of the level. And that's what I ended up doing with. So if you manage to catch a ride in a parabeetle, which you can use as music blocks, by the way, to do so... Uh, it makes it a little bit easier to, to jump onto the upper pair of beetles here. You can reach a secret area up here where you'll find a couple one-ups as well as a super leaf because you probably won't have time to grab it down below. Um, I also decided to add a mushroom into one of these music blocks just to better justify their existence here. Um, that way uh, you can better guarantee that you get a super leaf because by the way, um, I actually did something I don't normally do. Well, two things. One, I actually made this mostly a normal Mario level. That's something I don't really do. Most of my, most of my Mario levels are kind of gimmicky in this one, and granted this one is kind of too to some extent, but the actual level portion itself is very true to Mario 3. Um, I actually went back and studied Mario 3 levels and tried to make it as true to that as possible um, while you know giving it its own like unique flair, in my opinion. Um, so I can make it a little bit more fun, too. But I did try to make it like as true to, as if it were actually designed to be a Mario 3 level in mind, um, so yeah, so that's why, uh, my point is that I actually use layered power-ups here. Meaning that it won't just be a Super Leaf that appears, if you're not, it'll only appear if you're Super Mario. Otherwise, if you're Mini Mario, it'll, or Normal Mario rather, um, or Small Mario, it'll be a Super Mushroom instead. So that's why adding a Super Mushroom in the music block earlier, um, will, will kind of guarantee that you get a Super Leaf, you know, at the point where the game in the screenshot shows you should get it. Woo, alright. So, um... So that is my level in a nutshell, or the level itself. There are a couple of things I want to point out here real quick. Um, it, actually, there's a lot I could talk about, but again, I'm under a time limit here. So what? So as part of the whole idea of what is the point of parabeetles in a level if you can't, you know, if there's no danger of um, falling from them? Well, for one, I created a slight danger at points, and that is... Uh, I do have some gaps in, in the terrain. Now, there's not a whole lot of them. I really wanted to embrace the idea of having of having ground here, but they do exist to force you to use a pair of beetles at some point. Now, beyond that, something else I did I use a pair of beetles for, as you may have already saw, there are actually multiple paths through this level. Um, so that's why I think it's a lot of fun to play through yourself to kind of discover these paths, where if you're, uh, if you manage to get up to this, if you manage to jump onto this question block up here, the first question block in the level, you can actually use these pair here. I can probably just show you, in fact. Yeah, I just took a screenshot for no reason. We can use these to reach a secret area above. And I totally screwed up. And I just died as a result. Awesome. Um, but up here you'll find, I think, a few one-ups. Uh, there's one, and there's two more up stacked above it secretly. And you can jump down to safety as well. Now, if you fall at any point, then, just, then that just means you'll most likely fall on this lower path, which is the primary path of the level. Um, although I really did focus a ton of energy on making this upper path feel... Um, really fun, and it's part of this too, by the way, or not just fun, but natural. Um, when you land down here, something I wanted to do was how it made it look like there's almost, it, it made it look like it's not safe down below. Like, it looks like you're, if you fall, you're pretty much dead. Um, whereas that isn't the case. If you fall, it's complete safety. So I thought that'd be kind of fun. If you manage to break, if you manage to do the tougher path initially, um, then it's going to look like you have to continue on the harder path, but if you end up taking the easier path, you'll actually see the easier path down below. Right there. Um, so you know, like, hey, I can take either path. I can try to follow their pair of beetles, or I can, um, you know, continue down below and take this path. And I try to make both paths, uh, you know, interesting and fun. Um, obviously this path is easier than the higher path, but I kept it, I try to keep it engaging all the same. Um, yeah. Now there are a couple of things that you might know here. Uh, let's see. Uh, for one, I have a secret area here that's impossible to see in the level itself. Um which just has Super Mario Bros. 3 M.I.A. Um, there's no point to it, you can't actually see it in the stage itself. But down below it, I have it up there that spare room. Because down below is where I have the warp zone area. Um, which maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's go ahead and actually go ahead and go to area 1. Um, or the primary area, which is where um, you start off in Bowser's Castle. Because I forget how this idea occurred to me originally. Wait, let me think. Um... Yeah, I, you know, honestly, I can't remember where the idea occurred to me originally, like, to make this kind of like a glitch-type level. But it, somehow I had the idea of, of, um, of, wouldn't it be cool, like, if you're in, you know, if you're playing Mario 3 and something goes wrong. So this basically, this portion right here is basically almost an exact recreation of Bowser's Castle. Down to the Bowser statues appearing exactly where they should be. Of course, they're not enemies in this case, whereas they shot, they shot laser beams at you in the original game, but hey, it kind of worked in this case because it's a little bit easier. I didn't want to make this to be, you know, I didn't want this to be too difficult of a level. 
Um, I even adjusted, uh, no, I did make so I did take some liberties here, uh, because everything, for the most part, it is one-to-one. -one. But I did change something, like the slight placement of some things, like these, um, donut lists in a couple places, to make it look better. To just make it look better, because with the window placement in the background, it does look kind of odd at some points. Um, also, I, I think I raised the whole level a little bit, so it's a little bit higher from the lava. That way I can center the windows a little bit better. It just looked weird having the windows like be way higher up than the level itself. So I think I did a pretty good job of capturing the essence of the level, you know, while making it also look like a recreation. Um, now something I did that's super important here is using the stop, the uh, the uh, stop scroll mechanic for a few different reasons. One, uh, as you saw, there are actually two, you know, you encounter two Bowser, two Bowser fights in the game, which I'll get to in a sec. But there are actually three Bowsers here. But I had to add a third one so I can mimic the fire, you know, the his fire breath that came through initially, um, in the initial part of the stage, just like in the original game. I put him on the track to mimic that. Um, so yeah, there are three Bowsers. You can't ever kill this one, but that's okay because they'll know he's there. Um, and that worked out because if you, you know, when you rewalk through the level and it's glitching, he's still there shooting fire, which I really liked. Um, so yeah. Uh, anyways, continuing on, we go through the door, which, hold on, you, it, I just screwed up how the screen stop, or how the screen scroll works. So you can see, you won't ever see that Bowser, normally, thank God, to, thank, or thankfully for a screen, uh, scroll stop. Now here we have, uh, the first fight against Bowser, and at first it looks like pretty much an exact recreation for the most part of the original fight. I did, an ac I did add an extra layer of bricks here, um, to make it look a little bit more intimidating, otherwise the stage is just way too low. Um, great, just die too. Again, I'm using scroll stop here, so it looks, it doesn't move at all just like the original stage. Now something else I did is, I, I, initially, I was gonna have you play through the entire fight itself, and I realized this is really boring. You've, and most everyone has already done this, there's no point having everyone play through the stage itself. And since my, my game is based around a glitch, I'm like, you know, why not just have a piece switch appear and have you easily take Bowser out? Uh, the whole, you know, and plus it would make it seem like, you know, it'd be your first clue that something's not quite right here. So you hit the piece switch, Bowser's dead, or hopefully he is dead. Um, he may not die depending on when you activate it, but he usually does jump into the lava eventually. Let's see if he does it in this case. Okay, he didn't. That's actually the first time I've seen that in eons. Um, now the reason I have, uh, the reason I added this little brick gap here is because you could have the piece switch drop by itself, but it made it too easy for someone to accidentally grab it just by jumping in the air or something. So I wanted to make it almost impossible to grab the piece switch by itself. That way you couldn't drag it with you elsewhere in the level. Not that I would really break anything, but I wanted to experience the level as I meant it to. So anyways, once you hit the peace switch and once you kill Bowser, uh, which I'm going to have to do in this case, um, to get that key, so we can get to the locked door. So I'll do it once just one second. Speaking of which, I timed it perfectly um, in which the peace switch would drop um, you know, shortly after Bowser touches the ground after jumping. So it kind of makes it look like he knocked the peace switch loose, which I thought was really fun. Um, so come on, I'm running out of time here. I got <laughs> Actually, I'm running out of time in real life. i got to hurry up here. I've got uh, a shuttle to catch, so we can go through the door, and then I love this part where it's like, wait a second, I'm, I was just here, and this is an exact recreation of the previous screen down to the window placement, which wasn't easy, but I didn't have a whole lot of room to work with. Um, so yeah, anyway, since the door's already unlocked, since you already unlocked it, you can just continue through the door. Um, and this is where the game starts glitching out. I added the glitch effects, I give you the mushroom, and that hopefully uh, allows you to realize that you can access a, super, a secret area over here using the Super Mushroom, if you don't lose it in the process, which, well, I just lost it. <laughs> Luckily, you can just play through um, the Bowser portion again to get it uh, without having to actually fight Bowser, really, because the P-Switch is already, or the door's already unlocked. So you can use it to access a secret area, and and uh, initially I only had a single brick to, ac to let it access a vine, but I thought not only did it look cooler if you had to break your way through up through the wall in itself, but it looked kind of glitchier too. Like, it looked like, um, uh, I don't know, it just looked like you're kind of like busting through the game. Now, in this case, I started mimicking how it worked for the first warp whistle, in in the original or in the first castle Super Mario Brothers 3 in the Boom Boom Castle we have to run along the ceiling you access a hidden door which you can't see in the original game and then that takes you to uh, a room just like this in which you uh, in which you get the actual warp whistle now obviously there aren't any warp whistles in this game so I had to recreate it so I recreated the warp whistle on the right side of the screen hopefully you realize that's what that is and you hit the on block It actually plays a Warp Whistle tune, which I recreated thanks a ton to our, our own composer being Peach Toadstool, who recreated the music notes of what a note block or of what a um, Warp Whistle would sound like using these dry bones and music blocks 
up here. So it's it barely fits, but it worked just well. I mean, but it, it fits just enough that it, it allowed me to recreate or allowed him to recreate the tune that worked perfectly with my um, with how I had the stage uh, uh, with the stage laid out. Like I don't think it could have worked almost any other way. Like I'm kind of baffled that it worked the way it did with my level layout. Um, yeah. Now something else I thought about is. In the original game, the room itself, where you get the warp whistle, is actually shorter. But I also realized if I recreated it here, then that meant that you could actually see the roof. And I didn't like that, because you couldn't see the roof in the original game um, once you dropped in. So I uh, so I extended the room vertically to better recreate the sensation of the room in the original game. Um, of having these really tall ceilings. Uh, and that also worked well, well with the taller you know, windows here. So anyways, you hit the, you hit the on and off block, which is why I have the on and off blocks here, to force you to hit it to open the way. Uh, you continue onward into the war into the actual warp zone, which I loved. Um, and I actually even have the the original music here, and I re try to recreate as closely as I could as possible. I have the ice tiles representing the water around the island. I've got warp pipes in their place, you know, in the proper place where they would be, and I'm using the music blocks to represent the moving water. Uh, I don't know if you noticed that, but yeah, I use the blue pipe as the entrance to kind of hide it among the ice. And I have a green pipe here, which is, the, of course, the main one to get to the level itself. Um, now, something you may be wondering is, why do I have these on and off blocks here? And that's because of something I realized from the previous screen. Uh, if you... Um, uh, I'm, 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 I'm getting confused myself on how this works exactly. But at the end of the stage, I added the idea of, you know, we're turning off the TV and the NES. And if you ended up dying over the course of the level, and... Uh, Let's, let's go in here. So, I added the checkpoints you may have saw in the main area, or in the main level itself, so you didn't have to restart the entire level over if you died, but because of that, it screwed up how the on and off blocks worked. So I had to have some way of, re of getting the on and off block back to the default, um, or back to the off position, I believe, uh, before you reach the end of the stage, no matter what case, no matter what the case was, or on, I can't remember. But in, in, in one of the states, uh, you know, no matter whether you died or not. So that's why I ended up doing that. Um... So yeah, let's see, is there anything else I want to talk about? I guess the only other thing I want to mention real quick is if we go back to the main area here, and by main area, I mean uh, the primary area, I was trying to think of how to wrap this stage up. And at some point I had the idea of like, why not building an NES? But I always like adding these little details at the end of the level, like the little, these little final touches. And so I decided to build an NES and I realized that the bridge itself almost looked like like the little text uh, on the NES, like the Nintendo text on the NES itself. So that's what gave me the idea to build it on the bridge. And then that led to the idea of using the bridge to turn off the NES by physically destroying it. Then that led to the idea of adding an on and off block here that you actually have to hit to turn off a TV I then added later, which kills the enemies on the screen, which uh, then allows you to, you know, which then is what allows Mario to escape the level. And it adds all this lore where Mario is like escaping actually into the real world. Like he escaped the game, he's going out in the real world to enjoy his life. Kind of like Truman Show, basically. So, yeah, not a whole lot else to say about it, but I spent a lot of time on the details here trying to make it look like an NES and an NES controller and a TV. And I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. So, anyways, guys, I am out of time. That is my Super Mario Bros. 3 The Lost Level. Level. Please play it if you haven't already. Um, I put a lot of thought into it. There are some secrets or some gameplay elements I didn't fully talk about here. So, hopefully you enjoy them, uh, playing through them yourself. And with that, I'm out. So, we'll catch you later, and bye.